I'm Eric Eastup, the pastor of Village Church, and so I am glad you have decided to join with us today as we are celebrating Father's Day. So I hope you guys are going to have a great a great day today. So you guys are special, and we have a special, just really a special focus on fathers today. But we are a meeting now inside of our worship facilities in Blythewood and also at Park Street at 9 o'clock and 10.30 in Blythewood and at 10.30 down at Park Street. And so whenever you are ready, we would love for you to come and join us in person. Uh, just one thing I'd like to share with you, and we're just we're kind of moving into that process of, of making plans for the future. I feel like we've been on hold for a long time, but we have uh, decided that we are going to open up our children's ministry again on Sundays, beginning on July the 12th. And so we'll be practicing social distancing and we, we really want to in, encourage you just at least to check that out about how we're going to handle those things. But July 12th, we're going to be starting up our children's ministry again. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, but before we get started and before our band leads us in a time of worship, I'm just going to lead us in a word of prayer. And then we're going to look into the scripture to see what the Lord has to say. So why don't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I am grateful for this new day that you've given us. And Lord, I just especially want to thank you uh, for our fathers. Uh, God, for the, the men who are in our church and for the fathers who raised us. God, we just we give you praise for them. I pray that they will have a, a, a wonderful day. But God, I pray that you'll encourage them in your word as you have given a calling for men to stand in the gap. Uh, Jesus, bless this day. And I pray this in Christ's name, amen. God bless you and may you be blessed by our time of worship. Well, good morning. Welcome to Village Church Online. Won't you stand up in your living room with us and worship with us this morning?
Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, He is my song. You are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good. Let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, He is my song. Sing it again. Let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, He is my song, don't you know? Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, He is my song. You Never gonna let me down. No. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. I'm confident. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. No, no, no. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. I'm confident in this moment. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me. team for leading us during this time. And uh, today, if you have your Bible, we're going to be looking in a, in a passage of scripture, or a book in the Bible that we don't normally go to. And so we're going to be looking today in Ezekiel, uh, the book of Ezekiel chapter 22. And we're going to look in verses 30 and 31. So if you're interested in where to find that in your Bible, you can go to the middle of your Bible and then turn right a little bit. You'll run into Ezekiel. 
Uh, but there was a, a, I heard a story about a father and son in Spain who had become estranged from each other. And it got so bad that finally the son just left the house and he did not return home. And uh, the father went looking for his son and, and he just couldn't find him. And it, this went on for like eight months. And so finally he decided to put an ad out in the Madrid newspaper that just simply said, uh, Paco, this is your father. Meet me in the town square this Saturday at 9 a.m. All is forgiven. I love you, Dad. Whenever he showed up in the town center that Saturday at 9 o'clock in the morning, there were over 800 Pacos in the town square who were looking for fellowship and forgiveness and love from their father. Now, I don't know if that's a true story or not, but it makes, that makes a good point. There is a great need for fathers. There's a great need for a fellowship with a dad, a great need for, for a love and leadership from a father. Now, what we are doing today is we are looking at the importance of fathers and the role that a father has and what God has called us to do. Because I really believe that there is a, a real underlying problem in our country today. And that, that underlying issue is really the involvement of a father in the life of his children. And so today in our passage of scripture, we're going to be looking at the importance of having men, men of God, who will stand in the gap for their children and for their families. And so that's why we're looking in Ezekiel chapter 22 and verses 30 and 31 today. Now, if you're not familiar with Ezekiel, I wanna give you a little background information. Ezekiel, of course, he was a prophet of God. But whenever this was being written, he was in captivity. He was in Babylonian captivity. He'd been brought there by the famous King Nebuchadnezzar, whom you might be pretty familiar with. But while he was in exile, there was a siege that was going on in Jerusalem. The walls had been breached. The enemy was getting ready to come in. And so Ezekiel said, we need men who will stand in the gap for our city. And, and the people were absolutely stunned that Jerusalem was about to be overtaken. I mean, it was the place where the temple was. It was the place where God dwelt. And now it's getting ready to fall. And there were some, there were some breaches in the wall. Now, what were the breaches in the wall? If, if you look in Ezekiel 22, you'll see that the breaches were actually spiritual ones. Uh, the people were worshiping different gods. They were practicing sexual immorality. Uh, there was defiance that was going on in the home. And as I, as I looked at some of those things, I thought, man, that sounds a whole lot like the world in which we are living today. And so the question is, well, how do we fix that? You know, how can those breaches that are in the wall, how can they be repaired? And what we're going to see is that God calls, he calls his men, and for today, he calls fathers to be men who will stand in the gap. So, so what, what is the requirement for us to be able to do that? We're going to look at a, a few requirements that are, that are necessary for us to be able to stand in the gap for our families. Uh, the very first requirement for standing in the gap, when I look in our scripture, is we need men who will be people of prayer. Uh, we, we, need, we need people of prayer, and that's, that needs to begin with the men in our homes. Now, I want you to look in verse number 30. This is what, what God says. He said, I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I might not destroy it but I found no one. Now, whenever I was reading through, you know, the commentaries to see what the breaches were that needed to be re repaired in the Bible, I, I thought it was interesting that those commentaries said that the, 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 the breaches in the walls didn't need to be repaired in order to keep the enemy out. In, in this instance, it was referring to the breaches in the wall needed to be repaired to keep God from coming in and meeting out judgment because of the disobedience of his people. And so to keep that from happening, Ezekiel was saying, but well, we need men who will stand in the gap for God's people so that we might not face God's judgment. 
An example of this is in Psalm 106, verses 19 through 23. It says, at Horeb, they made a calf and worshiped the cast metal image. They exchanged their glory for the image of a grass-eating ox. They forgot God, their Savior, who did great things in Egypt, wonderful works in the land of Ham, all inspiring acts at the Red Sea. So he said he would have destroyed them if Moses, his chosen one, had not stood before him in the breach to turn his wrath away from destroying them. So, so how did Moses stand in the breach for his people? Well, he prayed for them. And this is mentioned in Exodus 32, 12. He, he prayed to God. He said, turn from your great anger and relent concerning this disaster planned for your people. And God heard his prayer and the people were spared. And I think a lot of times people can, can view God as being one who is looking down. And he can't wait for us to make a mistake because he can't wait to beat us in the head. You know, he can't wait to discipline us. And they have a view of God as being vindictive and angry. But, but that's not who God is. I mean, God is a redeemer. He is a restorer. And, and there's no doubt that, that we are living right now in a time when we need to see restoration. And I, I think most of us would agree with that. I think most of us would nod our heads in agreement with that. But you know, when, when we nod our head in agreement to something, that doesn't, that doesn't really do anything. That doesn't make, make anything different. You know, putting on, if, if I were to go out and put on social media, hashtag restore or hashtag repent, that doesn't do anything. Well, then what does? You know, what is it that we can do that's actually going to make a difference? I'll tell you what it is. Men who are willing to pray. And, and you don't hear a lot of that today. A mantra that I, that I see going around a whole lot is whenever we're in times of, of need and trouble, it's very popular now to say, I don't want your thoughts and your prayers. Then what is it that people want? Well, they want, they want solutions, and I'm in agreement. I want solutions as well. But where we are looking for solutions is what concerns me. We are looking for people to make things better. We want more laws. We want to force people to do certain things. Now, let me tell you something. More of people does not make things better. What does? More prayer does. Now, why is that? Well, it's because we're acknowledging we need God. It's acknowledging that, that we need God's help because God is greater than we are. James 5.16 tells us about the power of prayer. It says, the urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. And so in our text, the Lord is waiting for men to rise up and to stand in the gap for their people. He, he was waiting for somebody to recognize, listen, the damage that we have in our, in our society, society today is caused by us defying God. And God's looking for men to stand in the gap. He'll say, God, we are sorry for this. God, we, we ask for your mercy. It made me think, Dad, are we, standing, are we standing in the gap for our families? You know, are we praying for a hedge of protection in the lives of our children over our marriages? And you know, so many times we wonder why our families are in ruin, why our country is run amok. Well, the answer, I believe, is, is rather simple. It's because there's no one who's standing in the gap. You know, God was calling for someone to stand in the gap and our text says, but no one did. In Exodus 13, five, it says, you did not go up to the gaps or restore the wall around the house of Israel so that it might stand in the battle on the day of the Lord. Now what happened because of that? Well, the city was overrun, uh, overrun and the people ended up in captivity. And, you know, we have, we have gaping holes in our spiritual walls today, and they're growing daily. You know, we don't, we don't trust each other. We believe the worst in people. Uh, we have a real, uh, just sort of like a real draw now to nihilism that people are going into. We, we refuse to be held responsible for anything. We want to play the blame game. It's always somebody else's fault. And those attitudes lead us to the same fate that the Hebrews were to face in our text. It, it led them to a place of defeat. But the fuel for change begins when men are willing to stand in the gap. 
And it's a whole lot easier being a spectator than it is actually being involved. I mean, I, I don't know how many of you go to, go to ball games, go to football games or baseball games, and it's, it's always interesting to me to watch the fans around me, especially when things aren't going well for your team. You'll see some guys, he's eating a hot dog, food falling out of his mouth, and he's like, well, if I was playing wide receiver, I'd have never dropped that pass. Or if I was the coach, this is the play I would have call, called, not that one. And I sit there and I watch him, and in my mind I'm thinking, well, then go play the game. You know, go, go out there and, and, and start coaching a team. Well, the, the, people aren't going to do that because that requires effort requires commitment. It's much easier to sit back and to gripe about the way things are than it is to actually have skin in the game. You know, Teddy Roosevelt, our former president, once said, it's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. It says the credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. If he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So what, what are some requirements for us to stand in the gap? Well, it begins in being a person of prayer. But I also see this, another requirement for standing in the gap is having the petition of prayer to actually pray. And again, in verse number 30, it says, I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I might not destroy it. Now, I know that whenever I think of standing in the gap, I think, well, I want to I want to be that person. I want, I want to be that father who'll stand in the gap for my family. But, but what do I do? What do I pray? What are the things that I'm supposed to say? You know, what, what, what is my prayer to be? And that's when I look in verse number 30 again. It says, God was looking for men who would stand in the gap on behalf of the land so that I might not destroy it. Now, when, again, when you look at the list of why the land was about to be destroyed, you see that what, what's mentioned is defiance of parents in the home, uh, immorality that was taking place. And, and the leaders of the day, they weren't, they weren't speaking out against them. They weren't leading the people in the right direction. They're just letting the country run amok. And I, and I think, again, this is a, a pretty good description of what's happening in our world today. Uh, parental authority today is, is tremendously lacking. I, I saw one of the professors at, at Harvard who had said that she was very frightened about the, the quarantine that's going on with coronavirus and so many kids being out of school. She said, because now those kids are actually being taught by their parents as if that was the worst thing that can happen. I, I see just like in this book, the Bible, sexual immorality was, is running rampant in our country today. I, I looked at some statistics. It just blows my mind whenever I see that 40% of all births that take place in America today are outside of marriage. I, whenever I look and I see that there are uh, around a million abortions that take place every year, that's almost 20% of all pregnancies. And then I, I think about how does that play out? Well, there's serious ramifications for these things. You know, if, if a child is born into a, an, into a home that only has one parent, they are five times more likely to grow up in poverty than anybody else. Uh, they are more likely to experience domestic violence. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that that a single parent can't do a great job of raising a kid. I mean, they can, I've seen that before, but I am saying that the obstacles are much greater, that it's more difficult to do that. And so I believe it's the job of the church, the job of Christians to support families, to be praying for, for marriages, to support marriage. That is an institution that has been created by God. You know, in, in our text, there was selfishness that was going on. I see that in our world today. You know, we want to go with what I feel, with what I want. Well, let me tell you something. What I feel and what I want, when it's coming from my heart, Jeremiah 17, 9 tells me that, that my heart is exceedingly wicked and it can't be trusted. And the fact is, we need help. You know, people are broken. And when we're broken, men, it's our job to pray. We need prayers for restoration. 
We need to acknowledge that we are weak, that we need God's intervention to build us up and to give us strength. If you look again back in verse number 30, you'll see God was looking for someone to stand up and to repair the breaches in the wall. And I, and I, and I thought about this, and I thought, I th- I thought about it quite quite a lot lately, you know, with all the chaos that's, that's gone on with, you know, the, the coronavirus pandemic, and, you know, of course, we're, we, we, things were shut down, we were quarantined, all these different things. We're locked up in our homes. And so that's created a lot of chaos. But then, but then we finally began to, it looks like, get back out into society again. Things are starting to open up. And then we have all of these tensions and these uh, race issues that have, that have come up with what's taken place uh, with George, the George Floyd incident. And, and I think we can look at these things and we can say, you know, there's something that is broken in our world. And we're trying to, we're trying to fix it. And I'm, I'm all for trying to fix things. But I always get discouraged when I see that we are trying to fix things from the outside in. You know, we want to we want to make more more laws on top of the laws we already have. We want to make people do things that we want them to do. We want to force them to do things. Let me tell you something. If you want to see change, it will not happen from the outside in. And I'm speaking to Christians here. Real change happens from the inside out. You know, we're told in scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, it says he is a new creation. The old is gone, behold, the new has come. But if those things are going to come, then Jesus has to be shared. Men, we need to stand in that gap. We need to be praying, praying for God to provide us with, for, provide us with opportunities to share the good news of Jesus to, to pray that God will give us the boldness to speak the truth of Jesus and the restoration of Jesus. You know, when I was a kid, I used to love to watch the TV series Superman. And it, this is the one that was on, you know, like probably from the 50s. And I, and I love Superman. You, you, you'd see the villain, uh, you know, get caught by Superman. And he'd turn around and he'd have a gun. And, and he would empty the bullets right into Superman. And, and you know, Superman would stand there with his arms like this, his chest stuck out. And the bullets would bounce off of him. And then after the, the criminal had emptied his gun, then he would take the gun and he would throw it at Superman. And, and something inexplicable would happen when he did this. Superman, who had stood there and let the bullets bounce off of his chest, when the criminal would throw the gun at him, he would duck. And that never made sense to me. I was like, why would he duck? I mean, he's taking the bullets, but when a gun comes at him, he ducks at that. And I thought, you know, but as, as Christians, we do the same thing. Just like Superman, you know, we, we tend to cower and duck at things that shouldn't intimidate us. I mean, think about it. As believers, we are, we are perfectly loved and accepted by an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-everything God. And, and as, if, as if this wasn't enough, I mean, Romans eight twenty eight tells us that all things work together for good for those who love God and been called according to his purpose. So, so what should cause us to be fearful? I mean, you know, what more assurance can we have from God? Well, in truth, God has given us every reason to face this life boldly. And yet what I see a lot of times is we, I see adversity kind of come into our lives and, and we start reeling when things don't start going our way. I start seeing some, some things pop up in life and I see, you know, I see this pandemic has come and and, uh, and, and listen, I, I, there's, there's some things that are going on and, and there, there's some concerns I have and I want to be responsible. But whenever I see us as Christians living in abject fear, I think men and women, God has given us a hope for the future and he's given us power in prayer. James 5, 16, again, the urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. So man, if we're, if we're going to stand in the gap we see some requirements from us or for us. Well, what are they? Be a person of prayer. Offer your petition of prayer. And then here's the last thing. A final requirement for standing in the gap is to have an urgency of prayer. Verse 31, it says, So I have poured out my indignation on them and consumed them 
with the fire of my fury. I have brought their actions down on their own heads. This is the declaration of the Lord God. You know, one thing that uh, you know, I get convicted about in, in my life is a lot of times prayer is, my, is like my last resort, you know, when I see trouble. Um, and that, that is not good, you know, especially for a, for a pastor to admit that. Uh, that I would go to God as a last resort. But I see here that I am told that my prayers, your prayer, needs to be urgent. Now, why is it, why is it important for our prayers to have urgency? Well, this life's temporary. You know, we're, we're only here for a short amount of time. And so we want to make the most of our time. And so, man, that's why I want to encourage you. Be praying for your children now. Be praying for their future spouse now. Be praying that they will come into a relationship with God now. Because you're going to be surprised about how quickly that time passes. Before you realize it, your child is going to grow up and leave the home. And you have the most influence on the life of your children while they are with you. It is right now. And God is looking for you to stand in the gap for your children, for your church, for your family. See, God required, he was requiring a man to stand in the gap. He called for a man to stand in the gap. And verse number 30 tells us that no one was found. So what happened? Well, what happened is the nation was overrun. The nation ended up facing the judgment of God. And, and that's what concerns me whenever I look and see what's happening in our, our world today. You know, you know, right when we need men to stand in the gap, Right when we need men of the church to stand in the gap, you know, we, we have a pandemic. Where the, where the church, in, in, in our case, and except for the last few weeks, shut down for three months. I mean, we, we, we've, we have these challenges and these problems. Right, right when we see a great need for men to stand in the gap, we have people who, who are now saying, I don't want your thoughts and your prayers. You know what's next for us if we, if we just stay on that path, defying God? Same thing happened in our scripture. It's judgment. It's missing out on the blessings of God. So what's required? Men, we need you to urgently, to pray, to stand in the gap. And it's not the time to get distracted. You know, I, um, I'm not much of a video game player, but over the pandemic, all of our children were home, and that was unusual for us. So they're all home, and uh, my sons they 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 pulled out their old Xbox, and they ended up uh, getting a, a UFC Ultimate Fighting Championship game. And so they wanted me; they got me to play. Of course, they like playing against me because all the buttons on the control I don't get it, and so they just beat the tar out of me the entire time. So I, the, the new games I'm no good at. But I'll tell you a game that I always enjoyed. The game Tetris. I don't know if y'all know that. It's like the puzzle game. There's different pieces are coming down on the screen and you try to line them up and get them in order. And if you do that, then it, you know, it disappears. It blanks out a line. And then it just sends down more and more puzzle pieces. Well, you know, that's how life is. Life is coming down. A lot of pieces coming down. And we're trying to figure them out so that, that we can move forward in life. And I think sometimes we get distracted by the puzzle pieces of this life and we forget the most important piece in life that makes everything else work out, and that is a walk with God. You know, God gives us the key where our focus is to be in life. And he tells us, and there's, there's some Pharisees that came to Jesus, said, what's the greatest commandment there is? And Jesus said, oh, it's easy. So there's two of them. He said, first one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So this is the first and greatest commandment. He said, the second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we can get real distracted by a lot of side issues. And God says, you want your priorities to be right. You love God and you love people. You love God and you pray for people. You tell them about Jesus and everything else tends to fall into place. Men, we need you. We need you, fathers, to stand in the gap. Because you know what? There's, there's a lot of breaches in the wall today. A lot of things that get us sidetracked from God and his truth and his power to change lives. So my challenge for you is stand in the gap. Now, if we're going to do that, what are the requirements to do that? 
be a person of prayer. Have a petition of prayer. Be specific when you pray. And then have an urgency of prayer. Let me encourage you to begin by praying for your children and by praying for your family that God will protect them and that you will teach them the truth of Jesus. God bless you and I hope you have a happy Father's Day.